Thank you, Steve, and good morning, everyone. Eve and I are going to uh, give you, in, in a brief amount of time, uh, hopefully a sense of uh, our discussions and our research into uh, applications of neuroaesthetics, and, and specifically as uh, neuroaesthetics might apply to architectural criticism. Criticism is a marginalized design activity now many have written on uh, its, its lack of influence in the architectural press, in the popular press. Uh, we feel there is a role for it to play when we consider the opinion of, of many critics, theorists, historians, and others that design education is really uh, architectural criticism. Uh, we think there's something to be had, something to be enhanced, and perhaps neuroaesthetics is exactly the way to do that. So we are working from four theses uh, that I'll re read through very quickly. They're up on the screen. Uh, I wonder why I worried about font size in the first place. Uh, anyway, architecture with a capital A is principally about beauty, and that has held true through the long history of architecture up till uh, roughly the 20th century and the rise of modernism. Uh, secondly, architectural criticism as a formal pursuit is also about beauty. Uh, if neuroaesthetics offers, offers the potential for analyzing beauty, and analyzing is in quotes because I, I don't like the term and I couldn't come up with anything better in the time I had, uh, then neuroaesthetics may indeed benefit architectural criticism, and it's our view that that has the potential to benefit architecture. Now, when I, when I talk about architecture here and I talk about beauty, I want to make a couple important distinctions. One, this is architecture with a capital A. This is architecture as opposed to building and construction. It's a particular conceit of the profession, and it was understood uh, for a long, long time, till some point in the 20th century, as a matter of fact, that architecture and building were two different things, and architects obviously were involved with the first and not necessarily with the latter. And when I talk about beauty, what we are really talking about here is the pursuit of beauty, uh, not with defining or knowing exactly what beauty is per se. That's a slippery slope, and the neuroaesthetic uh, researchers are very careful to point out the, the, the many pitfalls on the way to claiming some sort of universal sense of beauty or some definition of it. I'm rather more interested in uh, the pursuit of it and, and what that might mean. I also want to recognize that uh, Contemporary architects, and, and I'm one, I've been in practice for 35 years, uh, do much more than pursue beauty. I wish that's what we could spend most of our time doing, but those of you in the crowd who practice uh, know how much else is involved in, in the profession and in the discipline of architecture. And in fact, in a state like California, beauty is no part of the definition of what an architect is legally obligated to do. It's to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the general public. There have been uh, a case, there is case law on defining welfare in terms of aesthetics or beauty, but uh, the case law is so minimal that you can practically recite uh, all the cases on one finger. So I'm going to, going to begin with one of three isms that I'm going to talk about, and that's classicism, the other two being romanticism and modernism. It's our contention that the fundamental ideas of classicism uh, combined with their, their, their counterpoints in romanticism go an awfully long way to explain what modernist architecture is all about. Uh, a few other influences thrown in, uh, but these, these basic ideas uh, get you there. And from classicism, we derive uh, our one formula in our lecture today, uh, and that is known as the Vitruvian Trinity, Vitruvius, the grandfather of us all, uh, the first century Roman writer who put together a compendium on architecture that has influenced uh, the profession and the discipline ever, ever since. Uh, and what Vitruvius said, and I paraphrase, is that all architecture is comprised of three elements, firmness, commodity, and delight. And so from the beginning, there was this understanding that delight or venustus or beauty uh, is an important component of architecture. Uh, but riffing on 
Vitruvius, 1,500 years later at the, the, at the beginning of the Florentine Renaissance, the great theorist Leon Battista Alberti said, and I paraphrase heavily, any ignorant fool can make it stand up and make it commodious. It takes an architect to make it beautiful. Therefore, reinforcing the notion that what is special about what architects do is this pursuit of beauty. And uh, in, in the history of classicism, we attempt, see attempts to, to codify the rules of architecture, uh, to define what it is about under the, the general notion that Architecture is about reinforcing a sense of harmony, which leads to a greater sense of universal order, order always being preferable uh, to a classicist to chaos. And if one makes har harmonious buildings, one is by definition creating a form of beauty. Uh, the romantic contribution is different, and, and romanticism uh, arising as it does somewhere around the middle of the 18th century is classicism's great counterpart. Um, this is uh, the period in which the idea of aesthetics comes into play, and aesthetics as somehow tied to science, uh, but also tied to emotion. Uh, this is the rise of the idea of history as a progression, architecturally speaking, of styles. And so the architect was now free to pick from those styles and to design as he or she wished, uh, which leads to eclecticism, which gives the designer a great freedom but becomes problematic when you try to set some kind of standard. So finally, modernism and Vitruvius back in play, and we, and we still quote the, the Vitruvian trinity to this day. Um, towards the end of the century, in discussing the lack of contemporary architecture to communicate with the man on the street. The, the theorist Robert Venturi said, here's the problem. We began with A equals F plus C plus D, and uh, people like Walter Gropius uh, uh, perverted the, the equation so that now D or delight is uh, comprised of function and accommodation, uh, which uh, begs the question, where indeed is the architecture? And that was Venturi's point. Architectural criticism, to shift gears for a moment, uh, comes to us in two fundamental forms. Uh, there are other readings on that, but, but essentially it's either normative or it's evocative. If it's normative, there is some kind of comparative standard that's used, and this is what we see in classicism. The earliest forms of formal architectural criticism uh, are, are the accounts of the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, the, the, the successor to the first school of architecture, and teachers uh, leading their students on walking tours, uh, declaiming the, the merits and demerits of buildings in Paris as a way to, uh, to understand architecture and the correct use of classicism, and therefore the, the opportunity to create beauty. The evocative approach is uh, a, a, an approach heavily aligned with Romanticism, one of its greatest proponent, John Ruskin. It's about emotion, it's, it's about well, evoking something. It's not so much about aligning oneself with any kind of set of rules or any kind of standard because it's now a personal pursuit. And so the roles in criticism have evolved over the years. Uh, beginning with education, it, it started as a tool of architectural teachers as a way to communicate values to their students, as a method of interpretation for the designer, and, and lastly, as a, a form of advocacy, often with the, the public interest, um, we wonder if, at this point, what we need to br bring back into, the, in, into the, the discussion is this consideration of beauty. And I'm going to turn it over to Eve at this point to discuss that. Thanks. Let's see if this is a good location. So when I look at these slides, what I see are some very interesting neuroscientific um, teasers in there. So when we look at the Aventine by Michael Graves just down the road, and we realize that what he does to create a, an impression that many of us put into this category is to create flatness out of 3D buildings. And interestingly enough, he has divergent strabismus 
he doesn't have depth perception? Is it because he sees differently that he is able to conceive of how to create something flat out of a building? We look in the middle and we see Calatrava, whose buildings move. And when we're within them, whether they're moving or not, the linear arrangement of those columns, the light and dark, creates the type of stimulus that I used to use in the vestibular lab to make people have a sense of movement and to show me whether or not they knew where vertical was. Sometimes to fall over, to find out which one of their vestibular organs wasn't working. And when I look at the wonderful basket, I ask myself, is this not a popular piece of architecture? Because it appeals to the object, part of our brain's recognition system, and it makes no sense for an object to be that dimension. So on entering the world of architecture from neuroscience, I asked myself, what are these principles that help us to either delight in or have a building that stands the test of time across all cultures? And what we see from a great deal of research that's gone on to date, that's multi-level process, and I'm delighted we'll have one of the leaders in this field of neuroaesthetics talking to us later, so I don't have to, in the next two minutes, talk about all the areas of the brain that have been identified as becoming activated during tests where we're looking either through MRI or other mechanisms of imaging or electrophysiology that shows certain parts of the brain change their activity levels when they're looking at something that is either deemed to be beautiful or deemed to be ugly or deemed to have some other effect. But the point is it's not a single point within the brain. It's a multidimensional system. And so when we think about the multiple sensory systems that have to be involved, we're getting closer to assessing why certain architecture works, why we consider it beautiful. We also have to add into architectural criticism the realization that, that evidence shows that some of this is developmental in terms of neurological development, as well as our exposure to built spaces changes our perception of architectural beauty. And so this is not a fixed, it's a dynamic exposure to design that perhaps trains critics to see differently, and which may be why the lay public consider that they know what beauty is, and they wonder why some of the architectural um, edifices that are built today don't fall into that category. And finally, we come into my first dive into neurophysiology, which was sensory systems. And now I realize I can match the scale of measure from neuroscience to the scale of what an architect has to do. So if I can more readily measure the physical stimulus that drives a sensory system and the perception thereof, then I have a chance of guiding at least the components of design that yield responses. And so I have my signal in my periphery here, and I see that I'm going to run through this like a New Yorker. Um, and so uh, the brain is tuned. If we look at the auditory system, what we actually see in the blue band, that with a tiny change in stimulus, you get an exponential and linear increase in responses. But if our stimulus changes too much, that response changes. That implies that the tuning of our auditory system from the sensory periphery all the way up through developmental tuning and feedback systems from the brain are tuned to certain set points. Could it be that these set points indicate the fulcrum around which awe and beauty and inspiration occurs? We have numerous Initiatives where we're actually taking some of this research and pushing it into architectural applications. So we go in on site and we measure actual sound levels in real spaces and we understand the neuroscience of masking. And we don't just do it globally. We ask ourselves, how can new technologies just mask where we want to and allow communication elsewhere? How does the acoustics of an office environment in the center here change EEG waveforms? And how can we hear, design, hear acoustics before design occurs? So all of these are asking us to look at the physical stimuli in very different ways.
Frequency is more than sound, it's also light. And we know that if we measure circadian light and we stimulate with very brief exposure to changes in light, we can change heart rate variability with highly statistically significant effects. We also know that we can now model this. We've created some new systems to model uh, the multiple dimensions of circadian frequencies, not just blue light, but more colors have been identified, and push this into our architectural modeling systems. We know that the eyes are also part of our balance systems, and if you see the eye slowly moving over here, this type of linear system is enough to change our perception of our own movement, our own perception of vertical. And we can use these principles, we can use these rules in designing our procession through a space and the experience that it gives us. Designing whether or not we have some fear and some awe or some muted tones which perhaps enable us to glide through a place. All right. Okay. All right. So thank, thank you very much for All right. Thank you. Oh, okay.